Good afternoon. Welcome to the University of Reading. Uh, welcome to this uh, public lecture, the second of this academic year. My name is Robert Vandenoord. I'm the Vice Chancellor. I promise you won't hear much from me. I know you haven't come here to listen to me, but I was going to introduce a speaker of tonight, Professor Emma Borg. Uh, and I will just do that in a moment. But a few things first. Um, thank you for coming. I know it's raining outside, so you've weathered that, but you all want to escape from the election campaigns. I do understand that. <laughs> um, we are filming the event tonight, and it will go on YouTube. So if you do not want to appear on the film, Ben is filming there. I, the, it's about focusing here, isn't it? So you won't be on it unless you want to come to the front of the <laughs> lecture theater. Right. Um, Professor Emma Bork, uh, I was given some speech notes and it would probably take me 10 minutes to read out all her achievements and wonderful things you've done. Now, I'm not going to do that. I picked out two things that I was particularly impressed by. One is, so in my five years here, um, I've presented a number of, or chaired a number of public uh, lectures, but this is only the first time I present the same person for the second time. And I think, Emma, you're quite exceptional for doing two uh, public lectures in the, the short, relative short term I've been here. And the other thing what I was really fascinated about is that, that one of your monographs is translated into Chinese. You know? M mine are sometimes translated into English, which I think is quite good. So, <laughs> but to have your book translated into Chinese is really quite something. I mean, I think that the topic of tonight's uh, lecture is about business ethics, uh, not for me to explain, that is what Emma will do. But I think it is quite an interesting time you know, where where we seem in the political world, everybody to move to extreme ends, not seeking compromise, not seeking solutions, but seeking to win an argument. And it is great that as academics, sometimes we still try to, to have an intellectual, if I dare to say that, discussion and conversation to try and make this a better world. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Emma Borg. Okay, so thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor, for that very kind introduction. And I'd like to second the thanks to all of you for coming out on a cold, wet November night. It's much appreciated. Uh, and the top title of my talk tonight is indeed going to be Doing Business Better, Should Reading Firms Have a Social Purpose? And I want to start, if I can get my clicker to work, by giving you a bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about tonight. But I want to absolutely start by flagging up the fact that this topic and the things I'm going to talk about tonight are very much the result of collaborative thinking that I've undertaken with a local social enterprise unit called Ethical Reading. And I know that many of you will already be very familiar with the work that Ethical Reading does. We're delighted to have the directors of Ethical Reading here tonight. Um, but for those of you who don't know about Ethical Reading, I'll talk about them a little bit more at the end, but I would encourage you, if you're interested in the things that we're going to talk about tonight and you don't know about the work that they do, please do go home, look them up on the web, have a look at what they do and see if you might be interested in getting involved with helping with the work that they do. I think they're a really excellent organisation. OK, so to the talk then. I'm going to start by asking a pretty fundamental question. We're gonna ask, what is the right thing for a business to do? If you're running a business, if you're working in a business, how should you behave in a day-to-day -day environment? What decisions should you make about the actions you perform? And we'll look at two possible answers to that question that lie at kind of opposite ends of the pole here. On one account, the things you should do at business are anything that maximise the profitability of your company, so long as those things are legal. Okay, so on this view, uh, private sector organisations are kind of profit maximisation machines, and that's going to lead to this view that anything goes as long as it's not illegal. But I'm going to guess the audience tonight is fairly self-selecting, and I'm going to guess that that view is not one that people find terribly attractive. So then we'll look at a second view, which is the idea that businesses have got to do better. You know, they've got to set higher standards in the, business, in the practices that they engage in. They've got to be aspirational about the things that they do. And we'll look at some reasons for thinking that that second position is indeed the better position. But if it is the one that we want to go for, then we face another immediate and fundamental question, which is how do we get them to be better? 
You know, assuming we're not living in the environment that we want to, we don't think the relationship between society and business is right at the moment, how do we get from where we are at the moment to where we want to be? And I'll look at some kind of extant answers to that question, some ideas about how we change business behaviour. We'll look at reputation, regulation and culture, but I'm going to go very quickly through those. If I was giving a different kind of talk, it'd be interesting to look at those a bit more. I'm going to go through them very quickly and suggest a couple of worries with them because I want to get on to my positive proposal, which is the idea of social purpose. So social purpose, some of you may be aware, has become a real buzzword recently. You know, I woke up this morning coming to give this talk, put Radio 4 on at about 10 past 6 this morning and heard somebody talking about social purpose for business. Someone will mention in a moment. You know, I think if you get onto Radio 4 onto the Today programme, that means you're talking about something that's, you know, pretty hot at the moment. So I'm going to talk about social purpose for most of the talk, but I'm going to try and raise some worries about it, OK? I'm going to raise some cynical views about how effective social purpose can be in affecting change, because I think in order for social purpose to lead to change here, we've got to be really clear about why we think firms have to have a social purpose. And I'm going to suggest two possible arguments for showing us that a, a company must have this kind of wider social purpose, what I'll call the business argument and the philosophical argument. And it'll probably come as no surprise, at least to the philosophers on the front row, that I'm going to suggest it's the philosophical <laughs> argument that really matters here. It's one that's doing the legwork. Um, and that's the main part of the, uh, of the talk tonight. And I'll close just by looking at maybe some next steps for the idea of social purpose, what we might do in the future, and then I'll conclude. OK, so let's start with this fundamental question about what the right thing to do is. And let's start off with a little thought experiment, because I'm a philosopher, and that's the way philosophers like to approach problems. They think about some hypothetical situations. So I'd like you to imagine that you're either running or working at an investment company, and you become aware that there's a particular kind of trading practice that you could engage in. It's a trading practice that involves trading certain kinds of shares. We'll call them hashtag shares here. And you trade them really rapidly between a syndicate of banks, investors, and hedge funds. And it turns out that if you use this practice, you can give the appearance that these shares have multiple owners. It turns out that actually at any given kind of moment in the transactional system, there's only one owner, but it gives an appearance of multiple owners for these shares. And furthermore, it turns out that any owner of hashtag shares is entitled to a tax rebate. So if you deploy this trading practice in your day-to-day -day work at this investment firm, you're going to benefit your clients. Okay? Your clients are going to be able to apply for a range of tax rebates that they weren't eligible beforehand, and that's going to be good for your company. Right? It's going to lead to better client satisfaction, more clients. So the question I want you to ask yourselves then is, should the business either allow or maybe even encourage the use of this trading practice. Is that a good thing to do at work? Is that something people should be doing at work? I think I won't take a show of hands here, but just settle the question for yourself whether if you were there, would you use this kind of tool? Well, it turns out, and those of you who work in financial services or are familiar with it may perhaps have recognized the trading tool I just described as very, very roughly being the basis of something that's come to be known as the Cumex scandal, which has hit continental Europe in recent years. This trading practice was used pretty widely across European countries, and it led to significant losses to the state. It's currently being prosecuted in Germany, so people who deployed this practice are being prosecuted because in Germany it led to an estimated loss to the state of about 36 billion euros. Okay, so that's 36 billion euros of taxpayers' money that got paid out that they think shouldn't have been. So I think this practice is likely to turn out to have been illegal. So those of you who said you wouldn't use it, that's the good answer, that's the right answer. The regulators are not coming knocking on your door just yet. But even if that's the result with this particular trading practice, I think we can consider a whole range of other practices at work that fall into the same kind of category. So if you're in a business that involves selling, should you engage in hard selling practices? 
Should you deploy as a firm clever tax avoidance techniques? Remember, tax evasion, very illegal, don't do that. Tax avoidance, paying a lot of money to very smart people to absolutely minimise your firm's tax liabilities, perfectly legal. Is that something you should be doing? Exploiting loopholes in environmental regulations. Okay, loopholes, you know, they're, they're not illegal. They are actions that can be undertaken within the law should your firm be engaging in that kind of practice. And I think all of these kinds of activities are similar because they define a kind of grey space. They're behaviours that fall the right side of the law, they're legal, but where they might make us feel kind of morally queasy. You know, we're just not sure that they should be doing them. So what is right or wrong for a firm to do short of being illegal? It's the question we face now. And one answer to this question is going to be that really anything that is legal goes. Because a standard view of private sector organisations is that they're defined by the purpose of making a profit. So on this kind of view, private sector organisations are these profit maximisation machines. They exist to maximise shareholder value, and they do that by providing goods or services which people need or want at a price set by a free market. And that leads us to the view that any kind of practice that increases shareholder value but isn't illegal is going to be a good practice for that company. Now, I think it's important to note that even if we have that kind of quite hard-nosed view of what companies are in the business of doing, it's still going to be the case that the private sector does good for society. Okay? Even under this view, the private sector is going to satisfy the wants and needs of the society. It's going to provide jobs and employment for individuals. It's going to pay at least some level of tax. Those are all things that society wants, right? Those are all things that are good for the society, but they're kind of unintended consequences. They're not what the firm is aiming at. They're just these unintended extras. So this view of what corporations are doing then is most famously associated with the work of an American economist called Milton Friedman, writing mostly in the 1970s. Milton Friedman's view, I think, is more nuanced than he's often given credit for, but even so, he did say things like, the only corporate social responsibility a company has is to maximise its profits. And that sounds pretty much like this view we've got over here, right? It sounds pretty much like the view that companies are just about delivering profit. So what's wrong with that view, then? Why shouldn't we adopt that kind of picture? Well, I think what's wrong with that view is that it's got us to where we are now, right? And where we are now is in a world where the business sector has been rocked by a lot of kind of systemic scandals. That's to say scandals that relate to not just the poor performance of one or two individuals, but the misbehavior of the structures of the organization. So there are lots of pictures I could have had here, but here are just a few of my favorite business scandals. Uh, so this one, OxyContin is an incredibly powerful opioid painkiller developed by big pharma companies like Purdue in particular, currently being investigated in the States for the mis-selling of OxyContin because it's largely implicated in the uh, massive misuse of opioid painkillers <coughs> in the States and the you know, um, problems that they're having in that country. So mis-selling around drugs. Uh, this one will be very familiar to everybody, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data misuse, but you could have had a lot of different firms up here, right? So Facebook gets a really bad rap for it, and it should do, but there are lots and lots of companies that are misusing your data, so I don't think Facebook is special in that way. <laughs> um, the various kinds of environmental scandals related to the big oil and gas companies, the diesel emissions scandal that rocked car production uh, a few years ago, and then across the bottom here, various scandals that occurred in the financial services sector. This is where most of my research has been concerned. Um, so this is the events around the crisis of 2007 to 8, the financial crash that involved the collapse of Lehman Brothers. There were a lot of instances of kind of systemic poor behaviour by banks and others around the crash. This is the mis-selling of personal protection insurance in the UK, one of the biggest scandals banks in this country have had to face. This is the fixing of the LIBOR interbank lending rate. We don't really need to know exactly what LIBOR is, except to know that it's not something you want to have fixed. Um, and I kind of like this picture because I don't know if people can see it, but it gives us 
some of the fines that were imposed for non-compliance with LIBOR regulations. So if you can see here, RBS was fined £390 million. The Swiss bank UBS was fined £987 million for its engagement in LIBOR fixing. And Barclays was fined a mere £290 million. So, you know, these are big numbers. And we'll come back in a moment to the role that fines pay in this kind of sector. So the idea that profit is the defining purpose of a corporation seems to have got us into a bad place. So it seems that we want businesses to do better, right? We want to move away from where we are right now. But how are we going to do that? How are we going to get firms to do things better? Well, I want to suggest to you that the traditional tools for curbing the worst excesses of business behavior aren't really doing the work that's required. And we could talk about this a lot, and I'm happy to come back to it in Q&A if you'd like. But just very briefly, reputation used to be a real driver of behavioral change in companies, I think. It's no longer clear that it plays quite that role. And I think there are a range of reasons for that. It may be that public trust in big business is already so damaged that they now just see, oh, it's another scandal and just kind of discount it. We know that customer activism is actually pretty limited. You know, people say over their cornflakes that they're not happy about the level of tax that Amazon and Google pay, but they still do all their shopping on Amazon and they still use Google as their search engine. So actually, customer activism isn't really driving much change here. And that may be something to do with insufficient diversity. Maybe we need more competition. But reputation no longer seems to be a sufficient driver on its own. What about regulation and fines? Really interesting, I think, to think about the relationship between regulation and the kind of behavioral change that we want to see in this sector. But there are various reasons to think regulation on its own, again, isn't going to do the work required. So regulation, rules seem to be simple. The conditions that they're trying to rule about seem to be very, very complex. Rules seem to be backward looking. We want behavioral change going forward. So lots of reasons to think that rules aren't quite doing the work here. And they also encourage game playing. So actually, Colin Mayer was the person who was on Radio 4 this morning, if you heard him. He's got an excellent book called Firm Commitment, where he really spells out some of these worries about the kind of arms race you get into if you think that regulation is the sole answer here. Um, and fines. So that's why I read out the fines to you a minute ago. There have been some really significant fines imposed on companies in recent years as a result of poor performance, or poor behavior, sorry. But they don't seem to be changing very much. There seems to be at least some evidence that really fines are just being seen as the cost of doing business here. So on their own, again, fines don't seem to be doing the work. So what else could we look to here? Well, following the financial crash, there was a lot of talk about culture. Right, so around the financial services sector in particular, but actually covering all sorts of areas of business, there was talk about the need for a culture change within business. And so there were a lot of academic papers written about culture. There were a lot of uh, government briefings, a lot of uh, kind of third sector. I could have had a lot of pictures here, but this is one by the group of 30, published quite recently in 2014 or 15, I think. Banking conduct and culture, a call for sustained and comprehensive reform. So culture was thought to be the way we were going to bring about change, at least in the financial services sector. But I think it's fair to say that it's not clear culture is really doing the work that we hoped it might. And I think there were a number of reasons for that. In particular, I think culture has just proven very hard to define, very hard to assess, and ultimately very difficult to change. So although there are still institutions thinking about culture a lot, it's not obvious to me that it's the right way to go here. So I'm quite a fan of the new kid on the block, which is talk of social purpose. The idea that private sector organizations should be contributing to social goods, to the things society needs, through having a wider purpose than just the purpose of making a profit. And it's purpose that I'm going to talk about for the rest of this session. So there's been an increasing uh, emphasis on the need for a social purpose for private sector organizations. And as far as I know, I think the first instance of this in recent time came from Larry Fink. So Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock, which is one of perhaps the biggest investment firm in the world. So every year, BlackRock is investing huge amounts of money in different companies. 
And every year, Larry Fink writes a letter to the CEOs of the companies that his firm is going to invest in. And in his letter of 2019, sent out to CEOs on the 1st of January, I always think that must be a nice thing to get in your inbox on New Year's Day, you get a letter from Larry Fink telling you what BlackRock's priorities are going to be for the coming year. And in his letter to CEOs of 2019, he talked about purpose. He talked about the need for the corporations that they were investing in to have a purpose that went beyond the profit uh, motive. And that led to him appearing at Davos and being interviewed on CNBC to talk about purpose. And I thought it might be nice just to hear what Larry Fink has to say about purpose here. Community. But the most important thing I said, and I repeated maybe three times, profits are paramount to everything a company does. Uh, they, and, and their connectivity with their shareholders is, 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 a, is about profits. What I did say, though, to remain... Um, in front of change, to be a part of a growth environment, I believe the, the involvement in a community to have a purpose is vital for long-term survivability, but long-term profitability. And I think most people, for most people, it resonates that, yes, you need to be connected to your employees. You need to be connected with your clients, your communities, and you operate. And that's really what the essence of what I'm saying. But mo most importantly, I believe the companies that have purpose are the best companies in the world because it unites their employees. It connects the clients. But most importantly, it, it brings um, a, the organization onto a common plane. And I think that's very vital. And I, you know, and I, you know, the best companies that I know of are the ones that work towards a purpose. So, okay, very good. Okay, so that's Larry Fink telling us what he thinks purpose is and why he thinks <coughs> firms should have one. And Fink's letter was met with pretty widespread agreement. Okay, lots of people have got on board with this idea of a need for a wider social purpose. And perhaps one of the biggest indicators was a major US lobbying group called the US Business Roundtable. That's a grouping of about 180 CEOs of some of the most significant co uh, companies in the world. So companies like Apple and Amazon and Coca-Cola and MasterCard and Visa. Uh, you can have a look at the list of them online. Some of the really biggest companies signed up to something called the Statement on the Purpose of a Corporation put out by this US Business Roundtable. And in the statement, they said that CEOs of companies should lead their companies for the benefit of all stakeholders, customers, suppliers, communities, and shareholders. And this statement was very widely received, got a lot of publicity, and it led to Martin Wolf, who's chief economist of the Financial Times, writing in the FT this September that with this sentence, the US Business Roundtable abandoned their long-standing view that corporations exist principally to serve their shareholders. This is certainly a moment. And I think when, you know, Apple and Amazon and the FT are telling you that something's going on, it's worth listening and paying attention. So that seems a good thing. But I remain slightly worried. And there, I think there are reasons to be worried about social purpose for a, a couple of reasons. So firstly, not everybody is on board with talk of social purpose. I suggested to you that there was widespread agreement, and indeed it has got quite a lot of momentum behind it, but certainly not everybody. So another really powerful lobbying group in the States called the Council of Institutional Investors rejected the roundtable statement out of hand, and they wrote that it is the government, not companies, that should shoulder the responsibility of defining and addressing societal objectives which have limited or no connection to long-term shareholder value. So this idea that these wider social purposes aren't the business of private sector organisations, they're the business of government, remains popular within areas of the business world. And actually, I just mentioned to you earlier that they were talking about social purpose on Radio 4 this morning. That's because Colin Mayer with the British Academy had today was launching his, I'm going to get the title wrong now, but I think it's the Principles of a Purposeful Corporation. 
Uh, and in that, he's talking about the need for corporations to have social purpose. And again, that's been something that was fairly well received, but you had people coming from the Adam Smith Institute who again rejected that statement and said that actually this is the business of governments, it's not the business of business. So we should you know, maintain our Friedman-esque view of what businesses are up to. So although I think social purpose has uh, a high degree of uptake at the moment, it's by no means universal. And I think more worrying is that the kind of language around social purpose is not new. Right. For those of you who you know, are familiar with the Companies Act, you will know about the famous or maybe even infamous Section 172. Right? So Section 172 has been around since 2006, and it specifically states that CEOs and directors of companies have a requirement to consider these wider stakeholders, so their customers, their supply chain, the environment, their communities. And in many ways, the roundtable statement echoes that earlier statement from the Companies Act. But we know that we've had a range of scandals since the Companies Act 172 was published. So why should we think that talk of social purpose now is going to do any more than it did then? How do we make purpose, talk of social purpose, more than just a buzzword? in this area. Why is it not going to, you know, if I was giving this talk five years down the line, why would it not be up here with culture? Culture didn't change anything. Why should we think purpose is going to do any better? And I think the answer to that question, how do we make purpose more than just a buzzword, is to become, is to get a greater degree of clarity about the arguments behind purpose, thinking about why we think companies should have a social purpose. Why should we think that the, uh, the private sector has to have more to it than just the profit motive. So that's what I want to turn to now. Why do we think companies should have a social purpose? And it seems to me that there are two arguments we could give here for why we think firms should have a social purpose. One is what we'll call the business argument. I'm not going to talk about it too much tonight, but if people are interested in it, there's a really nice TEDx talk by an economist called Alex Edmonds. He will give you a range of numbers and facts and figures to do with the social, uh, to do with the business argument that I can't go into details with here. Um, so the, the business argument for social purpose then says that there's going to be a genuine bottom line dividend to your firm of behaving in an ethical way. So doing business better is going to result in happier, healthier, more productive employees. It's going to secure greater loyalty from your customers and suppliers. Could also have had here, it's likely to lead to a lighter touch regulation. It's hopefully going to stop firms being nationalized when they might be otherwise by changes in government. These are going to be things that are going to benefit your company's bottom line, right? If you have happier, healthier, more engaged employees, you're going to be more profitable. If you have greater loyalty from your customers, it's obviously going to benefit your bottom line. So the suggestion is then that there's an ethical dividend to be had from behaving in the right kind of way. And I think that's right, okay? I think if you go and look at Alex's talk here, the facts he gives you, the evidence he gives you about companies that have a better ethical profile than others will show you that there is indeed an ethical dividend to be gained. So I think this is a good argument, but I don't think it's an argument that goes far enough. And the reason I don't think it goes far enough is that it leaves the notion of social purpose entirely in the hands of business. If it turns out that a business thinks it can be perfectly profitable, perfectly you know, long-term successful without having a social purpose, then it's fine. That company can just put the notion of social purpose in the bin. Because really, it's about self-interest. And if you don't think your self-interest is going to be benefited from it, from having a social purpose, there's no requirement, according to this argument, for you to have one. And if you think back to a moment ago when I played you the little clip of Larry Fink talking about a social purpose, I think it's pretty clear that it's the business argument that's mostly driving him. So he talked about social purpose being needed for long-term survivability and long-term profitability. It's the idea that we should ground social purpose for businesses in the self-interest of that business. So I'd like to suggest to you that we need another argument here to run alongside the business argument. And given my background as a philosopher, I'm going to suggest it's a philosophical argument that we need here. 
So now we get to the philosophy bit of the talk, my favourite bit of the talk, and I'm going to start my philosophy quiz. I've only got a couple of these. Does anybody know who this might be? This is a tricky one. I think the next one's a bit easier. He's rocking some pretty impressive eyebrows. Anybody? Yeah, somebody at the back. Not Kant, no, although I can see, yeah, I can see why you would say that. Hobbes, no, not Hobbes. Shall I give it? I mean, my front row of philosophers have not even made a suggestion here about who it is, so I'm, it's not surprising that the general audience is not getting it. So this is actually Thomas Paine. You know, guys need to go home and look at some more pictures. Um, Thomas Paine, in his absolutely seminal book, The Rights of Man, had a lot to say about the relationship between business and society. And in particular, he said this. He said, the invention of commerce, for which I think it's okay to read business in general, the invention of commerce is the greatest approach towards universal civilization that has yet been made by any means not immediately flowing from moral principles. So Paine's idea here, then, is that business is a force for good in its own right. It's a force for social change. And it's going to take us from the position we're in now to a more civilized, a more just, or a more moral situation. And this, as sometimes, oops, not going forward, has come to be known as the do commerce thesis. So do commerce roughly translates a soft business. The idea that business can be a force for good in society in and of itself. So here's my second slide, my second photo of a philosopher. Anybody know who this philosopher is? Yes, very good, absolutely right. This is Adam Smith, often known as the father of capitalism. I always think when I put these slides up, you know, this is what philosophers look like in the past. This is why I feel I should have come with a wig on or something. <laughs> um, so Adam Smith was another big advocate of this do commerce thesis that Paine set out. And he thought business could be a force for good in and of itself. And the reason that business is a force for good in and of itself, according to do commerce, is because it inculcates good moral characteristics. Business is good because it makes people good. Why does it make people good? Well, because if you're going to engage in trade, you have to um, be honest, you've got to be fair dealing, you've got to ignore kind of traits that aren't relevant to the trade that you're doing, you've got to be honest. A whole range of kind of characteristics that are going to lead you to be successful in business that are good moral characteristics. So I'm going to give you one more quote about the Do Commerce thesis because it's my favourite quote and because I know that we've got a lot of people who, you know, work in business here tonight and I want you to go home feeling good about what you do in your day-to-day -day lives. So this is my favourite quote about Do Commerce. It comes from Samuel Ricard in 1704 and Ricard wrote, Commerce has a special character which distinguishes it from all other professions. It affects the feelings of men so strongly that it makes him who was proud and haughty suddenly turn supple, bending and serviceable. Through commerce, man learns to deliberate, to be honest, to acquire manners, to be prudent and reserved in both talk and action. Sensing the necessity to be wise and honest in order to succeed, he flees vice. So this is a nice positive picture. I'm sure this is what you're all doing at work every day, fleeing vice and rushing to the wise and the honesty. So I think do commerce is a nice thesis. It's attractive. We would like to think of business being a force for the good. But it's got some problems. Okay. It's got some problems as even Adam Smith, who was one of you know, the main proponents of this view, even Adam Smith recognised that it was a limited thesis. And its main problem is that the do commerce thesis is only going to hold where the benefits of cheating are outweighed by the benefits of honesty. I've written it the other way around there. I just realized it doesn't hold where the benefits of cheating <laughs> outweigh the benefits of honesty. So it's not going to hold where, these, where it pays to be bad, right? So it's not going to hold in any kind of market where there's an inequality of power, which includes an inequality of knowledge or information. But if you know anything about the kind of market we're operating in, you'll know that it's one where inequalities of this kind are rampant. 
So do commerce, we haven't got the kind of preconditions that are required for do commerce. When I put that slide from Ricard up, what I should have had was really sensing the need to appear honest and wise. The trader needs to appear to flee vice. And if you can get away with just appearing to flee vice, according to this, that'll be fine. So we've got to worry about do commerce not holding in the kind of market we've actually got. And a second kind of worry, I think, is that it focuses very much on individual character traits. It's the idea that business is good because it makes business people better. I would like to think of a do commerce thesis which attacks the kind of more systemic relationships between business and society. So what I think we need now is an argument showing why business must be a force, must be a force for the good. So why private sector organizations must have a social purpose alongside their profitability purpose. Why should we think do commerce holds? Why should we think business has a social purpose, should be contributing to the social good? And I think the answer to that question can be found in something called social contract theory. So social contract theory has been put forward by a range of very famous philosophers from Hobbes to Locke to Rousseau and Rawls. They've all argued that the core relationships between individuals and states should be understood in these contractual terms. Okay, so we agree to give up certain freedoms that we might have enjoyed in kind of the Hobbesian state of nature because we recognize that giving up those freedoms allows us to live in a world that's overall going to make our lives better. So, you know, to give you an example, it might be that I've got some particular freedom in the state of nature that I really enjoy. Um, I don't know, maybe I just really enjoy running and jumping on people's feet. It's just what makes me happy. You know, I like that look of surprise as I land really heavily on their toes. But I recognize that actually, I don't really want to live in a world where you're all free to come and jump on my feet. You know, I recognize that some people are bigger and heavier than me and it's really going to hurt and that's not really going to make my life better. So I decide to give up a freedom that I've enjoyed in the state of nature. I decide I'll give up my right to go and jump on your feet in order to live in a society where feet jumping is generally disallowed. And overall, that makes my life better. So, what the social contract theory tells us then is that our relationship between these organizations of the state and the individual is a kind of rational agreement. It's grounded in a sort of tacit contract that I take out between these organizations and myself as an individual. And it makes clear why people, the reasons people have for endorsing any given set of social rules, because entering into those rules entering into a tacit agreement that underpins those rules turns out to be a rational decision based on what individuals require to flourish. Okay, so it's rational for us to give up our freedoms, to live in a society that has the protections of law, because overall that's better for me than remaining in the state of nature. And I think this way of thinking about our relationship to um, larger institutions carries over pretty directly to thinking about the relationship between societies and the businesses that operate in those societies. So societies, I think, enter into social contracts with businesses, whereby businesses benefit from a range of social goods. Okay, so businesses require a number of things in order to uh, exist. They require things like good transport links. They require a well-educated workforce. They require protection under the law, uh, limited liability very often. They may require support in a crisis. Think about what happened with the big banks during the financial crash. These are all things that society gives to business. And by business taking those goods from society, I suggest that they tacitly agree to create appropriate social value to be organizations that are, of value to the that are of value to the members of that society. Because that's the only condition that would make it rational for us as a society to let those businesses operate within us, within the organization. So I want to suggest to you that it's the nature of the social contract for business that gives rise to an absolute requirement for private sector firms to have a social purpose 
to do good for the societies in which they operate. And this is a form, I think, of do commerce. It's a form of the claim that business is a force for good or should be a force for good in its own right. And it's grounded in the relationship between business organizations and the states. And I think what's important about this line of argument is that it captures what philosophers like to call the normative dimension of things. So it's not just the claim that we had with the business argument that your self-interest shows you you should have a social purpose. It's the claim that society has the right to demand that business organizations have a social purpose. It captures that ought feature of the request. Okay, so I, that's really the argument that I wanted to give you, the argument towards the idea that firms, even in the private sector, really need to have a social purpose and that we're within our rights to demand of them that they do. I'm just going to close by looking forward a little bit and thinking about where we might go from here. So I want to suggest that a firm's social purpose is something that needs to be worked out through collaborative dialogue. That's dialogue that involves business, immediate stakeholders, the wider public, and the government. Okay, we need a range of stakeholders contributing to work out what good a firm is going to do. Because it's all very well to say, you know, this firm needs to have a social purpose. You then need to work out what its social purpose is. Why does it exist? What is it going to do for the society? And I think, looking at the vice chancellor in the front row, it seems to me that universities are in a really um, interesting position to help facilitate those kinds of discussions, to be a kind of honest broker between business and government and other stakeholders in thinking through how businesses come to articulate their social purpose, how they come to think about what they're going to do for society. And I think it's very important that in developing a social purpose for an organization, it's one that's organization specific. So in tonight's talk, we haven't really spoken at all about the notion of corporate social responsibility, right, CSR. But you might have thought that when we're considering the way in which businesses behave towards society, CSR would be a major player here. The reason I haven't spoken much about CSR is that I'm not really convinced that it can do the work required here. And part of the reason for that is that when my colleague Brad Hooker and I started thinking about this, I told you we were thinking about the financial crisis, we went and saw a lot of banks, we had a lot of conversations with some of the really big players during the crash, they all have massive CSR arms. I mean, they are spending a lot of money on charitable enterprises. They're devoting a lot of their staff time towards helping out at community fates and whatever else. That did not stop them behaving in some really bad ways during the crash. And I think the reason for that is that CSR has come to be a kind of silo in an organization's operations. It's too independent from the day-to-day -day business of the business uh, to really affect change. So what we need if social purpose is going to do a better job than corporate social responsibility did is we need that change to be relevant to the things that the organization does. So it might be that a financial firm comes to think that it has the social purpose of creating value around something like financial literacy, really utilizing the skills of the staff that it has, the areas of expertise that it has to improve conditions in a society. A power company might have CO2 reduction as part of its purpose, where other firms just have maybe CO2 maintenance as part of their purpose, you know, because that's something that a big power company has the ability to change in a way that other companies don't. Lots of the businesses in this country aren't massive corporations. They're small and medium-sized enterprises, particularly in the Reading area. We have a lot of SMEs. They might have, as part of their social purpose, something really local, right? If they have a really strong local footprint, maybe that's what their purpose should be, improving local employability or employ, uh, improving local facilities in some very direct kind of way. So I think organizations really need to engage in thinking through what good their firm can do and how it connects up with the kinds of things that they do in their day-to-day -day business. 
And one of the reasons I like this idea of social purpose is I think it holds out the promise of new forms of oversight. Okay, so I'm not quite as optimistic as some commentators on social purpose that just because the CEOs of these big companies are telling us they're going to do things better, that things are really going to get done better. So I do think there's going to need to be a degree of carrot and stick here to make sure that change really happens. And what I like about social purpose is we could imagine a new form of regulation or a new form of oversight, which really deals with these kind of softer issues that we've been interested in tonight, and which thinks about the kind of social license that firms need to have to operate. So this is a notion that got deployed in the mining and extraction um, sector in particular. And it's thinking about what kind of agreement you need from your community in order to do the things that you do. And I think that could helpfully be utilised to think about how we might regulate reporting about social purpose and thinking about how effective it is in change. OK, so I just want to finish then by thinking about what we could do. OK, these have been fairly big debates about the way that governments and societies and businesses relate to one another. Most of us aren't in a position to affect massive change. We're not the CEOs of Apple and Amazon. Um, so what can we do? Is there anything we can do as individuals here? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is to use the many roles that we have in order to try and affect change, to make our voices heard about recognizing the need for business to be done better. So we should use our roles as workers, as leaders, as consumers and investors to really make the case for business being done in a way that benefits the societies that they operate in. And for those of you who are in Reading or whose firms have a footprint in Reading, I said at the beginning I would give another shout out for Ethical Reading. Really, it would be great to see more local firms getting involved in a movement like Ethical Reading. Because that would provide a real signal that there are firms in this country, firms in this area that are interested in having more aspirational standards, in doing things better. And furthermore, beyond just that kind of uh, commitment, being seen to want to do things better, Ethical Reading has a range of resources that you can use in your business to actually make things better. So at the moment, uh, there's a very interesting program going on between Ethical Reading and Reading Borough Council to think about what's involved in ethical recruitment, right? How do you go about being an ethical recruiter? And there's going to be a range of uh, resources rolled out very soon, I think. I'm looking at Antoine here, very soon. <laughs> End of Q1. <laughs> yeah. Launch on the 12th of March, uh, 2020. Okay, so you've only got to wait till the 12th of March and all these resources will be available to you to help you become an ethical recruiter. Or something like the uh, Ethical Reading Code of Ethics. That was something that I and Brad were very involved in helping with. Writing a template for businesses to adopt. A code of ethics that helps to raise the profile of ethics in your company. Helps to demonstrate some behaviours that will help make your firm more ethical. And I think taking those kinds of steps, whatever size firm you work for, is going to help to make Reading a better place to work and to live because it's going to be a place where business is done in a better way. So just to conclude then, I've tried to suggest to you that the purpose of private businesses, the purpose of any private sector organisation is to make a profit. I think we shouldn't be embarrassed of the fact that private sector organisations need to make a profit to survive. And it's okay to make a profit, I think, so long as that profit is made while that firm is fulfilling its social purpose. So we recognise that the relationship between the business and the society needs to be rebalanced and that profits are only going to be acceptable to a society where the social purpose of the firm has been respected. And I think that if we had Reading firms that showed that they were aware of their need of the need for their firms to have a social purpose, that could lead to Reading leading the way in showing that there's a way to do business in a more ethical way. And if we did that, if Reading firms adopted this talk of social purpose, if they worked through and worked out uh, what their social purpose, the demands that it placed on their organisation, 
I think that would deliver personal benefits, right? It's going to be good for the people in your firm. They're going to have higher well-being, more satisfaction at work. It's going to deal, uh, deliver benefits for your company. So we looked at the business argument, and I do think that is a genuine argument, right? There is an ethical dividend to be had from doing business better, so it's going to be good for your company's bottom line. And clearly, it's going to deliver social benefits. It's going to be good for the community in Reading. And finally, I think it could also help to make our region a genuine world leader in showing how change comes about here. So we know that warranted public trust in big business is at an all-time low. And I think if we could get a critical mass of companies signing up to these kinds of movements in this area, it would make Reading a world leader in showing how public trust can be regained. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, <laughs> quite, quite a to the force. I, I guess by by have, adding your email, you're opening up to anybody who doesn't want to ask the questions here and now, but want to uh, exactly ask right. you later. Okay. <laughs> who wants to be first? Please. I think there might be a microphone yeah, on your way. Down. Sorry. Hold the thought for a moment. <laughs> Um, it, it struck me as you uh, presented the sort of philosophical, philo philosophical arguments for three, four hundred uh, years ago that are we looking at, at, at a sort of two very different ends of the uh, historical um, spectrum here, whereby business at the time was, and, and coming through the century, was quite happy for that business to be run on slavery. Um, then coming through the centuries in, in terms of uh, uh, discrimination uh, it, uh, again, against w women, uh, coming through uh, in terms of the kind of Wolf of Wall Street thing. And whereas where we are today with anything that a business does wrong is immediately on social media and, and the sort of judge, jury and executioner by, by so, social media. I wonder whether you, you think that the social purpose is being driven by companies wanting to do good for their reputation's sake or because it's the right thing to do. Okay, so I think a couple of things there. Thank you. That's a, a great set of questions. Um, one thing is clearly, you're, you're clearly absolutely right, that we should not look back with rose-tinted glasses and say, oh, there was a time when business was done with a really high moral standard, and now we've kind of slipped, because you're absolutely right. You know, the conditions of workers were much, much worse in the Victorian factories than they are now. Slavery, clearly a major <laughs> issue. Um, so it's not right to think that around the Enlightenment time, things were so much better and now we've got worse. I think that's exactly right. Um, but I do think that there are ways in which do commerce kind of straddles that historic issue, right? So do commerce is trying to tell you the business should be a force for the good, regardless of it, what, whether it was or not at the time that they came up with the thesis. You know, it's a thesis independent of the conditions that actually pertained at the time. So I do think it's worth revisiting, even though um, it didn't lead to change when it was first developed. Um, and then I think coming on to sort of what, what seemed to be slightly the second point of your question, which was, do we think people now are talking about social purpose because it's the right thing or because it's what they think they have to say in order to retain their customer base or whatever reason? So I think a couple of things on that. Um, I definitely think there's a, a worry here. So, you know, everyone's familiar with the term greenwashing, whether, you know, a company has genuinely made a commitment to environmental change or whether they're just doing that because they know it's going to sell better at the moment. I think in some ways it may not matter, right? In some ways it may not matter whether the real reason they're doing it is because uh, it's going to lead to more profits or because they've genuinely taken on board the idea that social purpose is good. As long as we get the right outcomes, we as a society may think, fine, you know, we don't really mind whether it's the business argument driving it or the philosophical argument that I gave you. Um, why I think the philosophical argument matters then 
is where a company doesn't buy into social purpose, where they just, you know, either where it is clearly a case of greenwashing or ethics washing, and we know that it's, they're still doing bad behavior underneath the lid, as it were, or whether, they, or whether they just say, look, I'm profitable enough, I don't need to worry about this stuff. So, you know, the statement from the Council of Investors who just said, that's the business of government, I'm in the private sector, I shouldn't have to worry about these kinds of things, that's for you guys. Why I think the philosophical argument matters is that I think it comes in at that point, right? It comes in at the point where firms say, I just don't care, because we have a reason to say, uh-uh, you, you have to care, because you are taking from society. It's not like you're operating in a vacuum. You are taking our transport systems, you're taking our education systems, you're taking our healthcare provision. Those are genuine goods that we are providing to you as a society, and they place a requirement on you, a requirement to be interested in the goods of society. So I think in terms of outcomes, it doesn't really matter what is driving, you know, do I care whether Larry Fink is really being driven by profitability and survivability or a genuine desire to do good. In terms of outcome, it doesn't really matter. Where it matters is where people don't buy in. <laughs> But I do think there's also an, sorry, there is also an interesting question about how we check on these things, you know, how we make sure it's not just ethics washing and it genuinely is making change. And that would be a topic for another kind of talk where we think about how we embed this in something like a social license. Yeah, but good questions. <laughs> so we've got one there and then at the very back. Hi. Oi. Um, thank you for your speech. Um, I have a question. You started in the beginning by talking about reputation and culture, saying that we can't measure culture and reputation. What about social purpose? How we can measure this, that um, it's not just ticking the box in a way like SME hired 10 local employees, they tick the box on social purpose. So how that would be measurable? Yeah, OK. So I mean, those are excellent questions, absolutely. And I think you know part of the thing that got Brad and I interested in this actually is that you know we teach ethics on a pretty regular basis we think teaching ethics is quite difficult and quite tricky we learned that you know in a lot of the financial services sector a lot of the big banks they just had a nice tick box, ex tick box exercise for your ethics teaching you know here are a couple of scenarios what do you think so and so should do if you didn't get them right you can go back and do it again and as long as you got 90 percent then you're fine to carry on that didn't seem to us like it was really getting to the heart of the problem about how people should behave in a work environment. So I think you're absolutely right that you need to be very careful that it doesn't all just turn into a kind of tick box exercise here. And you're also right that, you know, issues of measurability are difficult and they're tricky and we've been here before in many ways. So talk of the triple bottom line has been around for a long time. Uh, it's not obvious that that has really improved things substantially. So I think there's a lot of work to be done in this area. And again, maybe I'm just going to slightly say that it is work in progress. But I do think this idea of a social license where we think about, you know, measuring things that don't neatly fit into just numbers. There are ways to assess that kind of thing. Maybe we need companies to tell us a narrative about things. Maybe we need to interview stakeholders and see what their views of the behavior of a company is. There are ways to get at the ethical profile of a company that go beyond just looking at the numbers. So the numbers are going to be important. We have got to, if you really can't measure any of this stuff, then that would also be a disaster, I think. Um, but I also think there are going to be non kind of strictly quantifiable ways to assess these things. OK, there at the back. Oh, hi. Yes, I found your talk really interesting. A um, couple of points. Um, I would say that corporate social responsibility is a little bit like carbon offsetting. It kind of enables you to get a clean conscience without actually doing anything. Um, I was just going to say, in my opinion, one of the roots of modern capital, the problem with modern capitalism is the stock market-based financing funding of companies. Um, traditionally in, in Europe, specifically Germany, They've relied on uh, local Sparkasse and institutions like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's the matter of profit maximization. In other words, in any given time period, maximizing the profit. Whereas traditionally, more gentle uh, funders like the banks, the local banks in Germany, have been t content to wait six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, whereas stock market has a very, very harsh regime of 
well, it used to have quarterly reporting, and that is drives a kind of cycle of obsessive focus on profit maxi maximization in a very short time scale. What I'm trying to say is that maybe one of the ways of, in other words, companies are being driven to behave in this way. Then I don't think they're evil in themselves, but their stock market-based funding is driving them like that. So maybe we need to revisit the funding of companies and do it a bit more like they do in Germany in so many ways. <laughs> okay, I think, good question again. Um, I think there are a whole bundle of things that are going to help here. So I think thinking about funding systems are definitely going to be part of the story here. Thinking about different models of ownership might be important, you know, wondering whether we've got exactly the right structures of ownership for the environment we live in now. Um, and in a way, that's why I think these discussions need to be wider than they standardly are. It's why we need to think about kind of the state of affairs in the whole, as it were. Um, it would be quite difficult to move from where we are now to funding models more like they have in some areas of the continent, I think. But yeah, I'm sure you're right that that might be part of the answer here. It's trying to think about that kind of change. And it's interesting. So, you know, I know a lot of people who work in the city. If you look at the history of the city, you know, the, the changes that the financial services sector has undergone are one of the most massive of any kind of sector. And it's a substantive research question and really interesting, I think, to think about what we lost for when, you know, city changes came about. Yeah. I can run here at the front. I'll go back in a moment, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think the thing I love most about philosophers is there's no lack of ambition. <laughs> um, all, all this requires is a complete rethink of the yeah. financial system, stock exchanges, governments, relations with businesses and so on. So, so why not do it? Yeah. Um, so who are you talking to about this? Because there's a list of people you should be, regulators, governments, stock exchanges and so on. Who are you talking to on this? Uh, so we've talked to the Financial Conduct Authority <laughs> a bit. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I think, in a way, that's why I wanted to finish up with the what can we do mm. kind of slide. Because I do think that we need, in order to get the doors to open properly, we really do need a kind of groundswell of you know, community-level activism that just says, we don't want it to be done like this anymore. Because I will tell you, one of the things we found when we went to the big banks was that they weren't really that interested. You know, things had gone quite wrong, but, you know, if we went to Barclays, they still had their ethical values in 10-foot letters in their hallway, and they were quite happy with that, and they didn't really feel that they needed to speak to a couple of philosophers who were concerned about the way things were happening. Um, so I do think we need to think about what we can do as individuals. We do think to need, need to think about how we get our voices heard, about letting the people who are, can make the real changes here know that we want those changes to be made. We have talked to um, various kind of governmental bodies. We did quite a lot of work with the Banking Standard Board, Standards Board. We've talked to the Liberal Democrats. It's very hard to get an audience when Brexit and an election is going on. <laughs> um, so those things have kind of conspired. But uh, so that's in particular what we've done. But in general, I do think, and you know, maybe this is kind of pie in the sky, but I do think what we need is a more joined up conversation that takes people with business expertise, takes academics with theoretical expertise, mm -hmm. takes the regulator, takes the government, and gets them together to think about how we affect change in here. Because it seems to me that at least part of the problem that these thing, is that these things have been treated in too much of a silo way in the past, not enough kind of open conversation. So we're talking to some people, and we'd like to talk to lots more. So <laughs> I, I can give you a list of names. So I'll do it. Thank you very much, Dominic. <laughs> So halfway up, I, I see a lot of hands. There is a point where I'll have to refer you to Emma's email, but we'll, I we'll just say, take just a few a more. I I'm very to happy to take in. questions by email later, so please do send them in if you don't get a chance to ask. Thank you. It's been very interesting. Um, I am a small business owner in Reading, so it's very pertinent to me. Excellent. Um, but one of the things that I feel very strongly about is you're talking about businesses and companies in a very impersonal way, and they're all made up of people. Mm -hmm. And people have their own values and they have their own moral compass. And the question is, why do people just go along with what I describe as 
bad behaviour? Mm-hmm. Shouldn't we be starting earlier on and actually getting younger children, uh, you know, getting people to understand, what, you know, as my parents would have told me, what is right and what is wrong? I, so I um, think. And what sorry. steps could we be taking there to actually, you know, have some kind of social push to, for improvement? So I think that's great. And that is a really good question about, you know, companies are collections of individuals. And I do think. I've spoken in a very general way in tonight's talk, but the issues will be different depending on the size of organisation you work in, the kind of organisation that it is. So there are a lot of nuances to make there. But this question about individuals, I agree. I don't think people in business are generally bad people. I can't remember I told this anecdote to everybody, so apologies if you've all heard it before. But when we were going out and we were talking to the banks, we ran... Um, a very small kind of select workshop where we tried to get some of the really big players in from the banks to think about what had gone wrong and from the regulators and, and some of the legal companies. And we had a quite senior gentleman from Barclays there who said, look, you know, I wake up and I look at myself in the mirror. I don't think I'm a particularly bad person. And when I get to work, I look around the table at my colleagues. and I don't think any of them are bad people. And yet I belong to a firm that has done these in unarguably bad things. So how does that happen? How do good people end up doing these bad things? And what I like about Ethical Reading and other organizations like that is that they are trying to find a way to allow good people to not do bad things, you know, to, to take them. So I don't, I'm not sure that I agree that it's a question about teaching kids more about what's right and wrong. I think it's more about allowing people to take the moral compass that they have in their day-to-day lives outside business into the business environment with them, to make them feel that it's okay to stand up and say, I just don't think this is right. I know this is profitable, but I just it makes me uncomfortable and we should have a chat about whether this is really what we should be doing. Um, So I think it is, and and going back to the earlier question about tick box exercises, you know, I absolutely do not think that the ethics compliance training that you get where it says sit down at your desk for 10 minutes and tick questions here is helping people do that. I think what you need is something much more in depth, much more personal uh, and much more detailed to allow people to recognize the complexities of the situations they're in, work out how they weigh difficult, different ethical demands when they're in conflict, and come to a decision about the right thing to do. So, Any question just here at the end? Sorry, you just get, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for a brilliant um, uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, I've got two, two uh, things that I'd like to link up. The first one is you spoke about the philosophy of, uh, and I really enjoy that. But the problem that I, I seem to have is that um, internationally, uh, there's a lot of consensus about climate change, uh, barring Trump's uh, uh, derogation from the Kyoto Agreement yep. and so forth. And there's a lot of agreement in the world about environment and about a lot of things. But we haven't been able to have a consensus when it comes to uh, the corporate law. So there's no international corporate mm-hmm. law. Uh, and then this philosophy, philosophical idea, uh, how can we get it to be uh, a global idea? Because uh, the biggest corporations Mm -hmm. in the world are, I think, the most important in this uh, realm that you Mm -hmm. talk about, because then they have the uh, stakeholders, those that supply them, and then those that sell their products and on down. And if something is not just good in UK, because of competition, they'll move over to the next country Mm -hmm. or where there is less. So how do you fix your uh, philosophical argument in a global economy, where there is competition and migration of corporations? I think I'm going to suffer from my ambition here. <laughs> and that is an absolutely excellent question, and I wish I could give you an answer to it. I mean, you know, we said we weren't going to talk about the election and we'll stay away from politics, but one of the things that I find depressing about the Brexit debate is that most of the problems we're facing are not local within a jurisdiction problem. They are global problems. They are problems that traverse kind of local laws, and UK corporation law is not going to help solve them. So I think we absolutely need to be finding more ways to have global discussions about how we as a global community are going to meet these needs. And if I had an answer to how I get more global leaders to think about philosophy, I would absolutely be using it. <laughs> so. 
Sorry. Right. I'll take two more questions. Uh, I've got one down here, and you've been having your hand up, so that's the last question that I'll take. And then, again, any questions that aren't being answered in this session, please email Emma direct. Uh, yeah, this question follows on from the last one, really. Given we've got a climate emergency mm -hmm. um, and consumer activism isn't all that effective, is there not a stronger role for government in setting hard targets which go way beyond any sort of fluffy collaboration between business and community go, would go? Yeah, OK, so I think that's a good question. And I do want to kind of agree with you. I do think that there is an absolute role for regulation here. Um, so I don't know, so some of the stuff, uh, you know, the talk of social purpose, the US Business Roundtable statement, these are all in-house business statements, right? They're coming from business, they're not coming from governments, they're not tied to regulation. And I absolutely don't think that we can leave it to business on its own to come up with these kinds of things. So I'm in agreement with you that we need to have regulation. Uh, and for something like climate change, we might really want to be setting some pretty hard and some pretty ambitious targets because we are in a very bad situation. My worry with regulation as a single answer to this is that it really does seem to me that it very often leads to this kind of game playing, that you've set a rule, you can't make a rule that is detailed enough to deal with every complex situation that you're going to um, encounter. And if all you do to address these kinds of problems is to regulate and you don't change the mindset of the people who are having to abide by that regulation, you will just still be in this system where people are trying to find loopholes in it and ways to exploit it. And, you know, when push comes to shove, these really big global corporations have a lot more, you know, manpower than your government. They will find ways to exploit these things if they want to. So I don't think regulation on its own can be the right way to go. And also regulation is only ever going to be about setting kind of minimal standards, right? And really what we need is something much more aspirational. We want to say, you know, this is the absolute requirement, but we want you to be doing this kind of thing. And you're only ever going to get that by, as I said, changing the mindset. And that's why I think this collaborative dialogue is important, because if we just go around telling business, here's another piece of regulation, I, I just don't think it's going to work. So. Final question, just here. Thank you. Um, just building on what the last couple of questions have been about, really, um, it seems to me that shareholders have a lot to answer for. They're the ones who get the benefits. They're the ones who hold their hands up at the end of, end of the year asking for a dividend. They should be the one driving change, not regulation necessarily. But the real question that I have for you is, can you signpost us to a company that's doing it really well so we can go and look at them and find out what they're doing? <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah. Okay, so I absolutely agree with the shareholder thing, and that comes back to discussions maybe about ownership. And I do think, you know, it's the long-termism that matters here. So a lot of shareholders, we have a lot of big institutional investors who are just concerned about the immediate return for them. We don't really have that long-term shareholder in a lot of companies, and that is going to lead to problems. So we definitely need to find ways to make it possible for companies to care about the long-term rather than just the short-term. So I just want to agree with that. Um, what was the second point I've now immediately Wait, for? Oh, the company, the good, the good example, yeah. So, you know, in previous versions of this talk, if I was giving this talk a little while ago, I would probably maybe put Unilever up there. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's going to look less robust now. And it's also the case that, <laughs> you know, Unilever was subject to uh, takeover bids precisely because it seemed to be not returning enough to its shareholders and it hadn't convinced its shareholders that this was the way to be going. They were just concerned about profitability. So can I point you to a firm that's doing things really well? Um, you know, there are... One of the interesting things, I think, is that these big corporations are never going to be all good or all bad. So you might find one bit that's behaving really well, but quite often you'll then find another bit that's behaving really badly. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the good examples we've looked at. Brad, what would you finish with? <coughs> I mean, Mars has come out with some interesting statements just today about the need for longer-term purpose. Um, uh, my mind is going slightly blank at the moment, but that is probably a bad thing, right? I work in this area, and I'm struggling to think of someone <laughs> that's doing it really well. Um, L'Oreal, maybe? L'Oreal, yeah, they're well known for having high standards in this. Nine years on ten on the uh, index of uh, the best uh, ethical companies, which yeah. is a great achievement, although they've got Nestle as a shareholder, which is not very good. Yeah, 
Yeah. So I think, and uh, you know, again, that also points to the fact that there are going to be various different indicators, and some firms may do well on some indicators, less well on others. It's going to be a complicated picture. And that goes back to the earlier question about trying to find some proper metrics for assessing things here and trying to find some proper reporting. You know, one of the worries I have with CSR is there's just no reporting. You know, firms can put these things up on their website, say, we did all, you know, we spent this amount of money on charity. Nobody checks, nobody checks what it's doing or whether it's any good. Nobody is saying to firms, this is what you have to do. They're just doing it, you know, off their own bat. I think we definitely need to improve the way that we report about these things and the way that we check on them. So, but come back to me and I will think about some better firms. <laughs> um, I, I promised you last question, but I'm allowed to break my own rules. Of course. <laughs> so, are, are you using yourself as a customer or indeed as an employee to try and, and make the the you know, business is more ethical? Uh, well, that's a you know, loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sure much like most institutions or organisations, there are things I'm doing okay and things I'm not doing okay on. I have an electric car, that makes me happy. Um, one small example, right? I have two kids. Birthdays are always a nightmare with two kids. You can do something very easy on Amazon. You can set up a birthday list and then everyone can see what other people have bought for the kids and they can put what they want on there and they get crossed off. Makes life very, very easy. I try never to have an Amazon list for their birthdays. And it makes life much more difficult, right? I have to have a list put on some kind of document that nobody can ever access and then they have to tell me that it's there and I have to cross it off and then I have to let everyone know that item's gone. It makes life more difficult, and I think we should definitely make it easier for people to be more ethical consumers and more ethical investors. But it doesn't mean you can't do anything, right? I do find it slightly sad that, you know, we all tut-tut about Amazon and Google not paying enough tax, but, you know, if I looked at any of your phones, I bet you've all got Google on there. <laughs> yes, I, won't, I won't put the question to myself, okay. but uh, I'm, I'm not a philosopher here. Um, I hope you certainly have thought, found this uh, talk really thought-provoking. The number of questions that have come out just shows how, how difficult it is to, to address yeah, one of these problems easy. that we probably all recognise to a degree. Uh, you know, when, when the question on, on, on the shareholders, you know, actually we probably have invested in those shareholders because they are the pension, the pension funds, funds that are yeah. the ones that f put our money in. And, you know, and, and interestingly, when the pension funds do not return enough money to us, we get lo local conflicts because yeah. the money isn't good enough. Yeah, so it's it is not just, easy, that's definitely It's, it's right. a wonderful <laughs> example. Well, it is just how intricate the problem is. But I think we need some, you know, I, well, I love the question about ambitious philosophers. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I would, I really love my philosophers to be ambitious and at least do the thinking that is required to help change the world. <laughs> So for that, and for answering your questions, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you just to join me in thanking Professor Bob once more. <laughs>